Today is the fifth Sunday of Easter. We also celebrate Mother's Day today. Indeed, a very warm and a pleasant Mother's Day to all mothers viewing this act of worship. The colic for today can be found on page 170. And we continue in our book of common prayer on page 101 after the opening sentence. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We call it for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthy magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you came to be the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you will honor the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Today our service will take a slightly different format as we focus and celebrate our mothers. With the assistance of the youth of St. Christopher, we will attempt to do this. Well, we will be doing this as we view a number of mothers throughout the Old Testament, as we look at God's providence, as we examine their faith and reliance on Almighty God. From my heart to all mothers, thank God for our mothers. Mothers are sweet like roses that are blooming. They are beautiful like angels in the sky. They love when we give them hugs and kisses. They love when we do good things. They will even love us more when we do kind things to others. If we help an animal, they like what they see which is very kind so they are blue like buttercups and roses and they love us so when we give a helping hand they will show love like an air balloon mother and mothers are adorable and sweet like a sweet little birdie in the nest when we do bad, they hate what they see. So they give us advice and allow us to change. Happy Mother's Day to all mothers. I have a good, enjoyable day.
children by her. And Abraham, and Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar her maid, the Egyptian, 
after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto her Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. A large judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fell from her face. A word from the Lord. The first two mothers we will examine this morning is Sarai, later Sarah, and Hagar. Now, God had promised Abraham and Sarah descendants. But time was slipping away because God somehow seems to work relatively slowly and peculiarly. Our timing and our plans somehow do not coincide or line up with God's timing or God's plans. So Sarah hatches a plan. She has a young Egyptian servant girl named Hera. And so her husband will have descendants. She decides that he can have relations with his servant. And her husband does not object. Well, we're not told that he did. So going against God's plan, they set their plan in motion. Then things start to go wrong. No sooner than Hagar found out that she was pregnant, she started to flaunt it. Now Sarah feels bad and goes not just to complain to Abraham, but to blame him for the position she is now in. You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. To which he responds, she is your servant. Do what you think is best. But clearly she did the worst, treating Hagar so badly that she ran away. But an angel appeared to Hagar and instructed her to go back to Sarah and to submit to her. She eventually had the child and the child was named as the angel instructed Ishmael, which means God hears. But this is not God's plan. The heir promise was from Abraham's seed and Sarah's womb, not Abraham's seed and Sarah's mind. God promised Abraham, who is now a hundred years old, and Sarah, close behind that ninety, a child, and they both laughed. But she conceived and gave birth to Isaac, whose name meant laughter. And one day the two children are playing and Ishmael laughs at Isaac and Sarah heard and she didn't like it. So she complained to Abraham at this time telling him get that woman and she child from up here and he complied. And out in the wilderness Hagar put her son Ishmael under a bush to die. And she went a distance off so she would not hear his cries. But God did. God heard. And he delivered them, and Ishmael and Isaac, just as God had promised, became great nations. A mom in a million. When God was making mothers, as far as I can see, he spent a lot of time on one and saved that one for me. He made a perfect woman, compassionate and kind, with more patience and affection than you could hope to find. He gave this lovely lady a heart of solid gold, and after God has finished, he must have broken the mold. A reading from the Word of God written in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1 beginning at the third verse. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. 
I went up to ten can for Elkanah to make an offering. He would give portions to Peninnah his wife and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorstep of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. The word of the Lord. The second model being examined is Hannah. Hannah was barren. The Lord had closed her womb, we're told, and if that wasn't bad enough, the other women were making sport out of her. And year after year she tried, and year after year they laughed. In Hannah's distress, she cried out to God and asked him to remember her. And she promised that if he did, and granted her a son, she would indeed dedicate this son to him. And we're told in verse 19. Early next morning, they rose and worshipped before the Lord, and they went back to their home in Ramah. Now Canaan made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. You might ask, after pleading with God for a son, why would she then give the son to God? Hannah just didn't want a child. Hannah wanted to be a mother. Hannah wanted the curse of being barren removed from her. And the Lord, as she acts, remembered her. He not just remembered her with Samuel, but he remembered her with three other sons and two daughters. Let us consider that when God causes what we deem to be a problem, only God can solve the problem. It does not matter who you are, where you live, where you went to school, who your parents are, or what you possess. It comes right back down to God. Mother's Day prayer. Thinking of you on Mother's Day and saying a special prayer that God, who knows how dear you are, will keep you in his care that he will bless your daily life with joys of every kind with perfect health and happiness and peace of heart and mind A reading from the word of god written in the book of ruth chapter one beginning at the sixth verse then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way back to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, 
Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? I Do I still have sons in my womb that you may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. So go your way. I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? marrying? No, my daughters. It has been far more bitter for me than for that for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then she wept aloud. Opera kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to your people. To her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. The word of the Lord. Our third story takes us to Ruth. Naomi is with her daughters-in-law, Orpha and Ruth. These three women have some very unfortunate circumstances. They've all lost their husbands. But Naomi's grief is greater because Orpha and Ruth's husbands were her sons. Naomi decides to go back home and she instructs Orpha and Ruth to go back to their home, Moab, where life would obviously be easier for them. And at first they disagree. But Naomi is very practical. She explains to these two women, I have no more sons. I can't have any more sons. And even if I could, are you going to wait until you're old enough to marry them? And Orpha sees the light. She kisses Ruth, kisses Naomi, and she goes off on her way. But Ruth somehow makes a strange, a bold, and some might say a spiritually inspired decision. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn my back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord be with me, be it he ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. So Ruth stays. And she is by her mother-in-law's side. And one day Ruth is in the field working, minding her own business. The scripture says Ruth was in the field gleaning. And this man, an old man, a rich man, saw her. Boaz sees Ruth. Now she is minding her own business not looking for anyone, but she is seen. She is not searching for anyone, but she is found by someone. And this is where the story begins to get interesting. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without the guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. 
He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than even seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now if Ruth had somehow gone with the practical, she would not have been seen by Boaz. She would not have given birth to Obed. Obed would not have fathered Jesse, and Jesse, obviously non existent, could not have fathered David, from whom our Savior's lineage is traced. Are you seeing what faith in Almighty God can do? God has a plan, and when we trust Him, we are guaranteed a place on the 18, where we can all say, I love it when a plan comes together. Ruth made a decision not with her best interest at heart, a decision which could be seen as stepping out in faith and trusting God. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. She did not go with what seemed practical. She stepped out in faith and was rewarded. Often, we want to know, we want to see, we want proof of what the reward will be before we make a move. Your God will be my God. Love. A mother's love is something that no one can explain. It is made of deep devotion and of sacrifice and pain. It is endless and unselfish and enduring come what may. For nothing can destroy it or take that love away. It is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaken, and it never fails or falters even though the heart is breaking. It believes beyond believing when the world around condemns, and it grows with all the beauty of the rarest, brightest gems. It is far beyond defining. It defies all explanation, and it still remains a secret like the mysteries of creation. In many splendor miracle, man cannot understand. And another wondrous evidence of God's tender and guiding hand. A reading, a reading from the Word of God, written in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 to 16. But after a while, the wadi dried up, because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel, so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of all will not fail, until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she, as well as he and her household, ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of all fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. The word of the Lord. Our next mother is a widow in Zarephath, where the Lord has directed the prophet Elijah to go. And there's a famine in the land, and the Lord sends him to the region of Sidon, where he needs to find this widow. And he does. And he asks her for a drink of water, for her to bring it in a jug. And she obliges. 
And just as she is bringing the jug of water, suddenly Elijah wants bread. So the widow explains to him that she has only a handful of flour left and a little oil in the jug. And her intention was to gather some sticks, go home, and use this flour and this oil to prepare a meal for her and her two sons, after which they would wait to die. And the prophet Elijah doesn't seem to hear what the woman has said because now he instructs the woman to go first, make him a loaf of bread, bring it back, and then go and prepare a meal for her and her sons. But the woman somehow has explained to Elijah, there is no next, this is all. That is it. There is nothing more. She barely has enough for her and her sons, and now he is demanding to get some first. But he has come with a message from the Lord. And the message is, your needs will be supplied until the rain falls on this land. The flower will not be exhausted, the jug of oil will not go empty, until the rain falls. And she too does as the prophet instructs and her needs are met. Now if she had insisted on her own way, what seemed practical, using the little bit that she had, indeed it would have been the last supper for her and her sons. From the word of the of God, written in the book of Second Kings, chapter four, beginning at the first verse. Now there cried a certain woman of the ways of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did not fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be born men. And Elisha said unto her. What shall I do for thee? Tell me who, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thy handman maid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad all, of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, but even borrow not a few. And when thou art came in, Thou shalt shut the door upon thee, 
and upon thy sons, and shall pour out all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she, then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and those children of the rest, a word of the Lord. Our final mother from the Bible this morning goes to Elisha and she cries out because her husband is dead. She has nothing in her house and the creditors are knocking at her door demanding her sons as payment for debts owed. And Elijah asks her a question, what do you have in your house? To which she responds, nothing, just a little oil. He then instructs her to go to her neighbors, collect as many empty jars as she possibly could, go back home, close the door behind her, and fill these jars with the oil. This seems like a relatively ludicrous instruction from the prophet. How is this woman expect to fill empty jars, as many empty jars as she possibly could find, from a little bit of oil? A little bit of oil that is so small, she does not even think it is worth mentioning. What do you have in your house? Nothing. Just a little bit of oil. You see, this story somehow sums up all the other stories and it sums up our story as well. Just that the woman responding to Elisha, our natural response is to minimize what we have and overlook what God can use. She does not even think that it is worth mentioning. Nothing, just a little oil. Oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It was used to anoint kings. A symbol of joy and gladness, not just a cooking ingredient, but a gift that God gives. It is more than what many of us think it is. But the devil somehow has a way of moving in at the right time and causing us to despise our gifts. He can't necessarily take them from us because they are ours, given by God. So he causes us somehow to minimize and to despise and to stop using our gifts. We no longer enjoy them. We are called, however, to stop despising what the Lord has blessed us with. Your children, your children are so disgusting, and you keep promising to send them back from where you got them from. Your son, just like his lossless, good for nothing far. These children are gems, and to a family without children, precious gems. The piece of old house, we refer to the car as a Toyota, Nissan, or Suzuki GSR, good set of rust. The job becomes that hell hole with those deceitful roots. But these are all things that God has blessed us with. But the devil has caused us to minimize our oil, our blessing. The miracle for this woman was really in the pouring. When we feel poor, P-O-O-R, we don't want to P-O-U-R. When we feel small, inadequate, we don't pour because it just doesn't make sense. When you don't have what you consider to be enough, you hold on to the little bit that you have. No miracle is going to happen with that. We need to trust and we need to pour. The miracle really is in the 
pour in. Do not overlook the small things. And what we seem to think is so small that God can't use. God uses the small things, the insignificant things, the small people, the insignificant people. What do you have left? Whatever we have left is what God will use. But the oil only flows when we pour. Many of us have stopped pouring. Therefore, the oil has stopped flowing. I will pour more when I get more. But with God, it is when we pour that we get more. We have too many self-fulfilling prophecies. Nobody cares. Nobody loves me. Nobody notices me. Nobody appreciates me. Nobody is interested in me. And then we turn inwardly into ourselves and we stop doing things to cause anyone to care, to love, to appreciate, or to be even interested in us. We have the gift of singing. But two people in the choir who are jealous because they can't hit the notes that you can hit say that they sound bad. So you stop singing. And nobody benefits or enjoys the gift that God gave you. We are so busy praying for more that we're not hearing God saying poor. The miracle, our miracles, all of our miracles is about the vessel, not necessarily the oil. God cannot fill what already is full. This woman was able to pour into her neighbor's emptiness. You are his chosen vessels. We are his chosen vessels. With all of our cracks and chips and kinks and imperfections. And that is why he chose us. People will not value and compliment you. They will value and compliment what is inside of you. Conception in itself is a miracle. A child growing within another individual is indeed a miraculous feat. But conception is only the beginning. A mother can never stop or afford to stop pouring. Even those she did not conceive can be filled with her sweet monthly nectar of love. Today, let us remember all the women who cried out to God for children. All the women who cried out to God for the sake of their children. All the women who trusted, whose faith brought salvation. Let us thank Almighty God for mothers. Amen. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies If you're trying to feel the same old holes inside there's a better life, there's a better life If you got pain, he's a pain taker If you feel lost, he's a way maker If you need freedom, a savior He's a prison shaking savior If you got chains, he's a chain breaker We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fire. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. And there's a better life. There's a better life. You got paid.
You're the one 
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen or unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, one in being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Where would we be without our mother's love? Lord, bless our mothers with wisdom to teach and guide their children in a way that will help them to follow you and become men and women who will be pleasing in your sight. Give all mothers the patience to deal with the difficulties of their job and most of all, give them a special blessing as they care so lovingly for the gifts that you have allowed them the honor of raising. On this special day set aside to honor mothers, we ask for a special touch from the Lord for each and every one of them. May each mother in this room be granted a special blessing and may all of the work of her hands not be forgotten in your sight. Let her example to children be a guiding force in their lives. And may wisdom be passed down to the next generation of mothers. May the Lord continue to bless and keep all of you. Amen. I pray you'll be ours And watch us where we go Guide us with your grace. Guide 
us with your ways. Give us faith so Sorrow will 